are about to celebrate the festival of Pesach. And one of the most important events of the Jewish calendar, maybe the most important night of the Jewish year, is, of course, the Seder night. And the Seder night, we go through the Haggadah, which is a nearly 2,000-year-old roadmap and guidebook through the story of Pesach and through the lessons that we are supposed to absorb and impart in our children over the course of this festival. And we're supposed to tell the story of the Exodus. Our antecedents were slaves in Egypt, and the, Almighty did all, and the Almighty did all kinds of miracles to rescue them, and we were redeemed, and we were plucked a nation from amidst a nation, and this is when we became the Jewish people. And there were the Ten Plagues, followed by the splitting of the sea, eventually we made it to Sinai, and we got the Torah, and we became the Almighty's people. And when we tell over the story of the Exodus, and we try to relive and, and, and re-experience the redemption that happened this night, we too can tap into some of the amazing energy that is present on these days. What I want to do today is examine the two narratives of the Exodus. Of course, we have the Haggadah which, among other things, takes us through the story of the Exodus. It tells about the very low point at the beginning of the story. We start off with the shameful part of the story, and we end up on, on a great climax with the redemption and with the closeness that we have to, to God. And of course, the Haggadah is more about the story. And of course, the Haggadah is more than just the story. It also tells us about the importance of imparting this to our children and the four different types of sons and the various mitzvahs that we do to remember and retain the connection and the closest that we have to God on these days. So the Haggadah is more of a, of a comprehensive retelling of the story. It's not just the story, it's also the lessons and the mitzvahs of Pesach. But if you compare the Haggadah, with the retelling of the Exodus story in Scripture, in the book of Exodus, you find that these two are very different. More specifically, if you read the Exodus in the book of Exodus, you find that it's a very Pharaoh-centric story. It tells the story almost exclusively from the perspective of Pharaoh. Moshe is negotiating with Pharaoh. Pharaoh is making the Jewish people work. He initiates the work. He has this devious plan to stop the Jewish growth and to suppress them, eventually resorting to infanticide. All the babies, the male babies, are thrown into the water. He tries to get the Jewish midwives to buy in, but they heroically refuse. That's basically chapter one of, of the book of Exodus. And then we talk about Moshe. And Moshe is selected by God to lead the effort for redeeming the Jewish people. And the story basically details how he has to go to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh initially refuses to heed Moshe's call. And in chapter five, verse one, we have the first audience between Moshe and Aaron, his brother and right-hand man and confidant, and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, no, who is Hashem that I should his voice and to send out Israel? I don't know Hashem, nor will I send Israel out. And he makes the work worse. He exacerbates the pain of the slaves. And chapter 6 begins where God says to Moshe, okay, it's time to go back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh made things worse. Now things will get better. And again, in chapter 6, Moshe goes back to Pharaoh and makes the pitch anew. Speak to Pharaoh, God says to Moshe. Tell him all that I tell you, and he will eventually send the Jewish people out. Of course, his heart is going to be hardened first, but there's going to be all kinds of miracles and wonders and plagues that will befall Pharaoh and the Egyptians but eventually there will be the Exodus. And again, that's what happens. Moshe goes to Pharaoh and he makes the pitch 
And then he starts threatening, if you don't do it, all these bad things are going to befall you. So first he does the trick with the staff, turns it on the floor, trying to convince Pharaoh. Pharaoh is unmoved. And then he says to him, okay, we're going to do the miracle to turn all the water of Egypt into blood. So Moshe comes to Pharaoh and he tells him, so says Hashem, through this shall you know that I am Hashem. I'm going to convince you. You're a skeptic. Pharaoh, you don't buy in. I'm going to convince you. Look at this first miracle, the first plague. I'm going to take the staff that's in my hand. I'm going to strike the waters of the river, and they're going to turn into blood. And indeed, that is what he does. And of course, Pharaoh is unmoved, and the story continues. Again, Moshe goes to Pharaoh. Well, what's happened to the Jewish people this time? It's not even told to us. We have no idea what's happened to the Jewish people at this time. It's a story of Moshe, as per the instruction of God, going to Pharaoh and trying to convince him. So again, in chapter 8, Moshe does the miracle in front of Pharaoh. All the frauds appear. The magicians and necromancers of Pharaoh do the same. And Pharaoh, again, is unmoved. And so on and so forth. Plague after plague, Pharaoh is not convinced. Eventually, he does become convinced. And his heart is hardened. He artificially refuses to send the Jewish people until ultimately you have the last final plague, the death of the firstborn. And finally, Pharaoh is convinced and he sends the Jewish people out of Egypt. And in fact, if you look at the way the Exodus is actually described in chapter 13, verse 17, Vayihi b'shalach paro es ha'am. And it was when Pharaoh sent the Jewish people. It's almost like Pharaoh here is effectuating the Exodus. The Jewish people, they play a, a minor role, they play a passive role in the story of the Exodus. It's about Pharaoh. Pharaoh is unmoved. Pharaoh is unconvinced. Pharaoh is a skeptic. And successively and progressively with all these miracles, the resistance is softened. Pharaoh comes on board. His heart is artificially hardened, so it takes a little bit longer to make more miracles and more wonders to make the Exodus that more that mu that much more dramatic. Pharaoh says, "Pray for me." Pharaoh insists to, to, to send sacrifices along the Jewish with the Jewish people. He repents. It's a very Pharaoh-centric story. Now, if you contrast that version of the Exodus with the one told in the Haggadah that we read on the Seder, you find a very different story. How many times is Pharaoh's name mentioned in the Haggadah? I would imagine, I didn't count, but imagine the book of Exodus is, is mentioned, I don't know, a hundred times, lots of times. He's the central character. Moshe is trying to convince him. How many times is Pharaoh's name mentioned in the Haggadah? So I counted, but I might have missed a few. It appears three times. But he's not at all the central figure. And in fact, in one instance where Pharaoh's name is mentioned in the Haggadah, it's all about saying how he's not so special. And he's not such a bad villain. And in fact, Laban is even worse. What does it say? Pharaoh only decreed on the males. But Laban wished to uproot everything. We think of Pharaoh as the worst villain, says the Haggadah. No, he's not even so bad. In fact, Laban was way worse. So it's almost like the Haggadah is minimizing the Pharaoh component of the story. And the way the story is told in the Haggadah, it's very much from the perspective of the Jewish people and the relationship that they had with God. In fact, the name of Moshe does not appear even once in the Haggadah. So how does the Haggadah begin? Again, 
the story of the Exodus part of the Haggadah. It says we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and it doesn't really delineate the nature of the servitude. It jumps right away to the Exodus. And God took us out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, and had God not done it, we would be in big trouble, we would still be there, and we would still be suppressed to Pharaoh in Egypt. And therefore, because the Almighty did all these miracles and saved us from the Egyptians, we have to tell over the story that we do on the Haggadah. So we see these two Exodus narratives, one in Scripture and one in the Haggadah. And throughout the whole Haggadah, if you just examine the, the, the narrative flow of the Haggadah, you'll see quite clearly that the story that it's telling is the story of the Jewish people, not the story of Pharaoh. And the question that I want to explore today is why are there two versions of the same story? And why in Scripture is the story presented from the point of view of Pharaoh and the role of the Jewish people is not highlighted almost entirely? It's almost entirely not present. Whereas on Pesach night, we focus on the Jewish people, on their prayer, on their suffering, on their salvation, on what they experienced, on their imperative and requirement to thank God. The story of the Jewish people, the Jewish people's version of the events is highlighted on the Haggadah. So I want to suggest as follows. During the story of the Exodus, two amazing things happened. Of course, the Jewish people, they were slaves to Pharaoh. According to our tradition, they were on the brink of reaching a point of no return. They were on the brink of the 50th gate of impurity. And had they crossed over that threshold, they could never have been redeemed. They could never have been saved. So they were a hair away from being irreparably spiritually damaged. And almost overnight, they are uplifted and they're made God's people and they are shown miracles that changed all of history. The ten plagues of Egypt, the splitting of the sea, eventually the war with Amalek, they get the manna. It's a very eventful couple of weeks until they have the Sinai experience where a nation at the foot of the mountain, experiences prophecy alongside Moshe, gets the Ten Commandments directly from God, and starts the process of getting Torah. The Jewish people underwent a very significant, substantial, dramatic transformation over the course of the Exodus. But Pharaoh had a transformation as well. The first time he appears, after Moshe tries to lobby him to release the Jewish people, he says, who is God? Why should I listen to him? That name does not appear on my Rolodex. I don't know who he is. I'm not at all convinced by your pitch. And eventually, he starts to accede. He starts to accept God's dominion. And in fact, that's the explicit intent of many of the plagues. God says through Moshe, so that you should know that I am God, so that the Egyptians should know that I'm God, so that you should know that there's no one like me amidst the land. Again and again, the focus is let's change Pharaoh's perspective. He develops a knack for prayer. He makes peace with divine judgment. He says, I know why God's punishing me because I'm guilty. He develops humility. He understands the very important concept of reward and punishment. He ultimately sends the Jewish people free. By he Bishalach Paro and Pharaoh sent the Jewish people free. He developed faith. He developed submission and subjugation to God. 
There is a dramatic story that happens to the Jewish people, but there is a complete and dramatic transformation that happens to Pharaoh as well. And the Midrash give us, gives us some context. The Midrash tells us that there were 10 plagues that happened in Egypt, in Egypt, that happened in Egypt. And concurrent with the 10 plagues that befell the Egyptians in Egypt, 10 miracles happened to their Jewish counterparts in Egypt. So there were 10 plagues for the Egyptians and 10 miracles for the Jews. Moreover, after the exodus from Egypt, the Jewish people went to the sea. And what happened then? Again, there were 10 plagues that befell the Egyptians at the sea. And there were 10 miracles that the Jewish people experienced at the sea. According to the Midrash, there were 20 plagues and 20 miracles. The Egyptians, it's the Egyptians underwent 20 plagues, 10 in Egypt and 10 at the sea. And the Jewish people, they experienced 20 miracles, 10 in Egypt and 10 at the sea. There was an education and a transformation of both the Egyptians and of the Jews. The Egyptians were trained via plagues and the Jews were trained via miracles. The Egyptians were stricken by 20 plagues, 10 in Egypt, 10 at the Sea of Reeds. The Jewish people experienced 20 miracles, 10 in Egypt, and 10 at the Sea of Reeds. And everyone was transformed. The Jewish people went from a nation being on the brink of total spiritual decimation to being the nation that was worthy to sit before the mountain at Sinai and witness prophecy and accept Torah and become the Almighty's people. They were transformed via these 20 miracles. The Egyptians, chief amongst them Pharaoh, they too were influenced. They underwent 10 plagues, and they transformed from Pharaoh saying, who is God? Why should I listen to him? I'm not listening. I'm not sending the Jewish people out. That was transformed to Vayi B'Shalach Paro, Pharaoh sent them out. Evidently, the faith of Pharaoh and the faith of the Jewish people were experienced simultaneously via completely opposite means. The Jewish people achieved their faith via these miracles. Pharaoh achieved his faith via the plagues. Now, the question may be posed, well, how come the 10 plagues and 10 miracles in Egypt were insufficient and you had to have 10 more plagues for the Egyptians and 10 more miracles for the Jews at the sea? So if you examine the story very critically, you'll see that the faith and the transformation of both Pharaoh and of the Jews that was incomplete at the time of the splitting of the sea. Meaning that the first 10 plagues and the first 10 miracles did not fully achieve their mark. Pharaoh sends the Jews out of Egypt. The 10 plagues to Pharaoh worked. He sends them out. And he immediately regrets his decision. He rallies support from his people. He goes ahead of the 600 chariots. And he goes to try to pursue the fleeing nation. What did we do? Why did we send the Jewish people out? He cries. Wait a minute. Pharaoh, don't you know? You were trained. You learned how to pray. You learned about humility. You developed faith. This is why you sent them out. You had 10 plagues that influenced your thinking, and you were transformed. 
evidently, the first 10 plagues for Pharaoh were insufficient. They were moved. They sent the Jewish people out. But it wasn't quite complete. And therefore, there was still some work to be done. We needed 10 additional plagues to convince Pharaoh completely to complete his education. Now, the Jewish people in Egypt experienced 10 miracles. And they became worthy of the Exodus. They were a nation of idolaters. In Egypt, they had become accustomed to the ways of their Egyptian neighbors. But they get to witness all these miracles, 10 miracles in Egypt. And they say, we're, we're done, we're out of here. Now, in fact, the Midrash tells us that a large percent of the Jewish people, that a large percentage of the Jewish people actually remained in Egypt and actually died during the plague of darkness because they weren't convinced. But the Jewish people as a whole, they witnessed these, mir they witnessed these miracles and they decide it's time to go. And they are willing to take the sheep and tie to their bed for four days and slaughter the sheep, which was the deity of the Egyptians, which would be something that the Egyptians would kill you for. They did it nonetheless. And they roasted the meat so everyone in the whole neighborhood could smell it. Everyone knows exactly what's happening. They packed their bags. They display tremendous, valiant faith. And they leave, and they march out, and they go into the wilderness and the desert without a real good plan of how they're going to make it through in a place bereft of vegetation, food, water. They trust God. The ten miracles apparently worked pretty well. But then they see Pharaoh coming close. They see the Egyptians converging upon them, and they're trapped. And what do they tell Moshe? Are there insufficient graves in Egypt? Do you have to take us out of here to die over here? We should have stayed there. The faith that was achieved in Egypt was amazing, but not complete. There was still a little hesitation once they were threatened by the throngs and the masses of Pharaoh's army, and they were encircled. There was a need for 10 more plagues to befall the Egyptians, and 10 more miracles to be experienced and witnessed by the Jewish people at the sea to make this story complete. The Talmud tells that at the moment of the splitting of the sea, the angels went to God and asked him, Halalu of the Avodazara, Vehalalu of the Avodazara. These and these are both idolaters. Why are you splitting the sea to save the Jews and crashing the sea down upon the Egyptians to destroy them? They're identical. They're both idolaters. Behaviorally, they are indistinguishable. Why are some being saved and some being drowned? Even after the 10 miracles and the 10 plagues, the Jewish people, to a certain extent, was a nation of idolaters. There was still work to be done. What happened in Egypt, for both the Jews and the Egyptians, that achieved partial faith, but there was a need for 10 more plagues and 10 more miracles at the sea to prepare the nation for Sinai and to complete the education of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So, then the, so I think there are some several, so I think there are several very interesting insights just from the story of the Exodus. There were revelations of faith, both for the Jews and the Egyptians, concurrently, plagues for the Egyptians, and miracles for the Jews, and both were transformed. 
But what happened in Egypt, the first 10 blades, the first 10 miracles, that was insufficient. It had to be completed at the sea outside of Egypt. The way I think to explain this is as follows. The Jewish people were idolaters in Egypt. Why were they idolaters? Don't they come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why are they suddenly idolaters in Egypt? The answer, of course, is that they were surrounded by bad company. They were in Egypt. They were influenced. They were subjugated. They were enslaved. And they just followed the ways. They mimicked the behavior of their Egyptian masters. And after they were there for so long, they started to develop bad habits, and they became acculturated, and they became idolaters because that's what they knew after hundreds of years of being in Egypt. To solve this problem, you need to have, you need to address both reasons why the Jewish people are idolaters. You have to separate them from their Egyptians. You have to separate them from their Egyptian neighbors, which was the initial reason why they began, why they began to adopt the ways of the Egyptians vis-a-vis idolatry. And you also have to stamp out those bad habits that were accumulated over the course of hundreds of years in Egypt. So we have 10 plagues and 10 miracles in Egypt. And those accomplish the goal of distinguishing one nation from another nation. In the words of the Torah, to pluck one nation from amidst another nation. The Jewish people were enmeshed, were intertwined in the Egyptian way of life. And they might have had to pick out all the Jews, all the sparks, perhaps we can say, using Kabbalistic lingo, and pick them all up and gather them and coalesce them into one distinct entity that's separate from the Egyptians. And with 10 plagues and 10 miracles, the two nations are separated. A glass of water yields water for the Jew and blood for the Egyptian. And there's the famous image of the Egyptian sticking a straw into a glass of water and the Jew doing the same and the Egyptian suctioning out blood and the Jew water. What happened in Egypt was the separation of the two peoples into two distinct entities. These get miracles and these get plagues. But even after the Jewish people leave Egypt, perhaps we can say that structurally the problem's been solved. They are no longer enmeshed amongst the Egyptians. But habitually, the idolatrous practices remain. Some of the bad habits lingered after the cause of those bad habits went away. Perhaps the cause of the Jewish people's idolatry was solved, but some of the symptoms remained. And therefore, the angels look at these two people and say, wait a minute, these idolaters, these are idolaters, wait a minute, these are idolaters, and these are idolaters. Behaviorally, they're still identical. And I says, okay, that's exactly why we have to have 10 more plagues and 10 more miracles to forever stamp out the bad habits that the Jewish people had adopted over the course of their multi-century sojourning in Egypt. So I think just as an aside, there's a very powerful lesson here. If you want to change a bad habit, you have to address two different components of bad behavior, a bad habit. You first have to address the cause, the structure, the system of the bad habits. If the cause of the bad habits is the fact that you've been living in Egypt, you got to be taken out of Egypt. Once that is accomplished, 
you have to address the behavior itself. And that's the equivalent of now you're out of Egypt, you need 10 more plagues and 10 more miracles to remove the fact that these are idolaters and these are idolaters. The bad habits are kind of sticky so long as the cause is still present. You can have hundreds of years of learned behavior in Egypt, but once you're out of Egypt and you're cocooned in a healthy environment, an environment of holiness, an environment of purity, an environment where Moshe is leading the nation and the presence of God is there and you're eating manna, once you're in an environment that is very conducive towards positivity, all those bad habits can be stamped away quite easily. Hundreds of years of learned experience can be removed very quickly. So what do we see? We see a story of the Exodus from the perspective of Pharaoh and from the perspective of the Jewish people. Ten plagues for Pharaoh in Egypt, ten miracles for the Jews in Egypt. And they're both influenced. And Pharaoh says, ah, I don't know about God. Who's God? I'm not listening to him. Until progressively, these plagues make their mark. And Pharaoh is slowly transformed. The Jewish people, they too are at this nadir, at the very edge, 50 Gates of impurity is within sight, and they're transformed, and they develop faith, and they're willing to risk their lives to leave, go to the unknown, trust in God, roast their deities, or certainly the, de or certainly the deities of the Egyptians. Ten plagues, ten miracles in Egypt, ten plagues, ten miracles outside of Egypt. And Pharaoh has been transformed, and the Jewish people have been transformed in very different ways. Now we're told that whatever happened in Egypt is the template and the model of all redemption. We say Passover is Man Cherusenu, the time of our freedom, the time of our redemption from servitude. And that's not just referring to the redemption, and that's not just referring to the and that's not just referring to the redemption of your of Egypt. This is the time for all manner of redemption from servitude. And this is the template that all future redemptions will happen through. The concept of Messiah is taking the Egyptian exodus, making it global. This is the prototype. The Egyptian exodus is the prototype, the blueprint for all redemptions. And we're told two versions of what happened. Pharaoh was a non-believer. Pharaoh was an idolater. The Egyptians were idolaters. And they became big believers in faith and prayer and humility and submission to God. They were transformed. And that's one version of a redemption that happened. And the Jewish people, they too, underwent a transformation and were redeemed via a completely opposite way. They too experienced the transformation, but that was done via miracles. But that was done via miracles. It's a very positive, uplifting way to learn the same story. The fact that we have two versions of this story, and both of them together comprise what actually happened, and they're told in very different ways, Perhaps the lesson in that is to highlight the fact that redemption can happen in very different ways. There's a very difficult Talmud that talks about Messiah in the book of Sanhedrin, page 
98a. It tells us when Messiah is coming. Amazing. I've been looking for that information for so long. This is what we all want to know. The $64,000 question, the million dollar question, the greatest clickbait. When is it coming? Tell me the date. I'll make sure I'm ready. The Talmud already told us that 2,000 years ago. I'll read it to you. The son of David, which is a nickname for Messiah, will come. Drum roll, please. In a generation that's entirely righteous. Or in a generation that's entirely wicked. When's Messiah coming? I'll tell you, says the Talmud. It's coming when the generation is entirely righteous. If that's what the Talmud said, and that's where it stopped, I'll say, okay, that makes lots of sense. Everyone becomes righteous. You become worthy of divine revelation. The Almighty will reveal himself. We'll have an exodus on a global scale. Everyone will become believers. All the idolatry of their various different types will all melt away. Amazing. Makes a lot of sense. But then the Talmud continues and says, or the generation that's entirely wicked, which is literally the opposite. So what has the Talmud told us? So what has the Talmud told us relative to the, rel relative to the question of when is Messiah coming? It seems like it's given us contradictory answers. This Talmud never made sense to me. I always thought that you had to be righteous to be worthy of redemption. Our kids are always taught every mitzvah that you do, you're building another brick onto the temple. And every sin that you do, you're removing a brick from the temple. Once the temple's complete, it's going to descend from heaven, parachute down within, with fire from heaven. Miracle. It's going to be all over the news. Everyone's going to know Messiah is here. And world history, world civilization will transition to the next epic of existence. That's what I was told. And here we see that if the generation is entirely wicked, that's another way to arrive at the same conclusion. And here's the answer. The blueprint for redemption is the Exodus. And the Exodus is not just a story of a nation leaving another nation. It's a story of spiritual transformation. And it happened on two different fronts, on two different planes for two different kinds of people. And it happened via two exactly opposite means. Pharaoh got plagues, 10 in Egypt, 10 at the sea. And he learned the lessons of faith and prayer and humility and submission to God and reward and punishment. He was transformed via plagues. The Jewish people got 10 miracles in Egypt and 10 miracles at the sea. And they learned the exact same thing. You can arrive at redemption via miracles, via a generation that is entirely righteous. You could have the Jewish people's experience of the Exodus, and that could be the model, the template for your future redemption. Or, sadly, you could have Pharaoh's version of that same story. You could arrive at the redemption of the son of David via a generation that's entirely wicked. The conclusion will be the same, but it's a very different path to arrive there. Something is fixed. We will be redeemed. That part is immutable. It's foretold by the prophets. It's definitely going to happen. But how will it happen? Our sages tell us, look at the Exodus. That's the model. That's the blueprint. That's the template. And you get to choose. Do you want the Pharaoh version of the story? Or do you want the Jewish people's version of the story? Do you want the miracle story or the plagues story? Perhaps we can speculate the following. And this is a very controversial thing. And it's a very uh, 
it's likely to inspire some backlash, and I know that. So bear with me. The Torah tells us that Jewish people will come back to the land of Israel. It's found literally in the Torah. You don't even, to, you don't even need to go to the prophets. It talks about the ingathering of the Jews from all four corners of the land back to the land of Israel. It's a prophecy. And you know what? We now know today that this prophecy is true. We know it. It's true. It's been proven in our lifetimes. That, too, has an element of redemption in it. That, too, is part of the kind of the, the messianic transformation of the nation from a nation submerged amongst another nation or other nations being gathered in together and brought back as one nation in our homeland. I would argue that just like the Egyptian experience happened in stages, there were templates slash miracles in Egypt to separate the two nations into, or the two nations to, who, to separate the two nations who had become interspersed and intermixed and interwoven to separate them to two different nations that was accomplished in Egypt. And then to assure that behaviorally, the Jewish people don't maintain the behavior of their Egyptians outside of Egypt. There was a second set of templates slash miracles. I would surmise that if that's the template, if that's the model, if that's the blueprint, then the future mess messianic re redemption, then the future messianic redemption will likely follow that same pattern. There's one part of separating one nation from another nation. And then there's the process of making sure that all the learned behavior that the nation picked up amongst their time surrounded by other nations, that gets removed as well. Even after you are separated as a distinct nation, the angels can rightfully say, well, these are idolaters and these are idolaters. What difference exists between the Jews and their Egyptian counterparts behaviorally? And that necessitated a second, so to speak, redemption outside of Egypt, templates for the Egyptians and 10 miracles for the Jews. And here's where the controversy lies. The fact that we got the state of Israel, you can make a very good argument that we got it via the Pharaohitic process via 10 plagues, not via 10 miracles. And again, now we're looking back at history. This has already happened. And I don't think it's a controversial argument to be made that the way things played out, because of the Holocaust, we got the state of Israel. Like Pharaoh, we got a good thing via a very, very, very bad and painful thing, a very traumatic 10 plagues to give us a very amazing and redemptive good thing. And you can make the argument that we're only halfway home. Just like when the Jewish people leave, they unlock one level, but there's 10 more plagues and 10 more miracles that have to happen to see to determine or to forever separate these two nations. It's up to us what kind of Messiah we earn. It's reasonable, I think, even though it's quite controversial, I acknowledge. It's reasonable to say that we had to endure the worst suffering that any people in all of human history ever experienced to get the state of Israel. And we could perhaps in our mind envision a version of history where we got 
what was foretold that we would get in the Torah without the worst genocide in all of human history. We could have gotten it a more pleasant way. But we got the redemption via the Pharaohitic redemption. It's not so pleasant. And now we are awaiting another redemption. And we can read the story of Pharaoh in Egypt as somewhat of a warning. The Torah in the book of Exodus is showing us one side of the transformation and education and training. This ended up in a quite dreadful state. And that could be a warning to us. We too are awaiting a redemption and the choice is in our hands as to whether or not we will have a pharaohitic version of that. Like perhaps you can argue we already had a uh, down payment and installment of that version. Or perhaps the upcoming redemption can happen almost like it happened to the Jews in a more pleasant way in a generation that's entirely righteous because of our deeds, not despite of them. So we read the story of the Exodus in the book of Exodus, and we see a version of redemption that's very unpleasant, but that too is a way of redemption. There's the redemption of Pharaoh. And then comes along Pesach, and we say, you know what, it's time to tell the other side of the story. It's time to tell the more, it's time to tell the more inspiring version of what happened at the Exodus, what happened to the Jewish people. Let us look at that story because that too is an option that exists before us. And Pesach is a time of optimism. Pesach is a time of viewing the potential that we all have within us. After all, we come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the greatest people in all of human history. Those influences exist within us. We share the literal DNA and the spiritual DNA of these great titans. And every Jewish family gets together on Pesach, and we read the Haggadah. And we read the story of what happened to us, and Pharaoh's role is, is minimized. In fact, the one time he's mentioned in context, it's about, well, he's, he, he's not so important. Laban was even worse. Because tonight, we don't want to look at the pessimistic, painful version of redemption. Tonight, it's all about the positive, the optimism, the opportunity, what could be in the upcoming redemption. And I want to conclude with an idea that I heard from my brother-in-law, Shmuley Botnik, about how the Hangada starts off. So, of course, it starts off with a declaration Whoever wants to come join us in the party is welcome to join. This year we are here. Next year we'll be in Jerusalem. Again, the idea of the connection between the Haggadah story and the Exodus story to the future redemption, because this is the template. And then we introduce the evening with the four questions of the Manishtana. And then we have a short synopsis of the entire story. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and then we were saved. And we were saved with an outstretched arm, with great miracles, with the mighty hand. And it's imperative of us to relive the story. And then it tells us the story of five great Titanic rabbis who were celebrating Pesach together in the city of Bnei and they were telling over the whole story of the Exodus the entire night, all the way to the next morning. And there came a point in time where it was already time to pray. 
It was the time to say the morning Shema, and they were still telling the story. Can you imagine? Hours and hours telling over the story. And these are the great rabbis. And if the great rabbis are telling the story of Pesach, you'd imagine they know the story or the, the basic details of the story. They know it really well. But they're spending the whole night telling over all the intricacies of the story. All the more so, we too should spend some time in the story. But let's examine this little vignette, this little anecdote, a little bit more closely. It gives us the names of these five great rabbis. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Tarfon. These are the names of the first generation and second generation, really, of sages that form the body of what we call oral Torah after the temple was destroyed. The writing of the oral Torah began almost exactly once the second temple was destroyed. Temples destroyed, rabbis coalesced in Yavne. And who are the people of Yavne? The people that I mentioned in this story. Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Eliezer, their student Rabbi Akiva, and his sparring mate, Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Elizabeth Azariah, who was the head of the academy of Yavne. These are the sages that are trying to rebuild the nation after the devastation and the destruction of the Second Temple. And they're telling over the story of the Exodus the entire night until the morning. And what happens in the morning? It's time to recite the morning Shema. We're supposed to say Shema twice a day in the morning when we wake up and at night when we go to sleep. And they're telling the story of the Exodus the entire night, all the way till the morning. And their students say, okay, it's time. It's time to say the morning Shema. So here's what my brother will suggest. The oral Torah. The very first words of the official canonization of the oral Torah, the very first words of the Mishnah, go as follows. May Amosai Korin Eshma Ba'arvis. When do we start saying the Shema, the declaration of allegiance to God at night? Those are the very first words of the oral Torah. And the deeper message is that when we had a temple, we had stability and hegemony, and we had this base point of God in this world, and then we lost it. And right when we lost it, the sages asked the question, how do we say Shema? How do we have a declaration of allegiance to God at nighttime? When it's night and it's dark and there's exile, and we don't have the bright beacon of light of the temple. There's no longer an outpost in this world for God. How do we say Shema? How do we develop a connection of a human to God at night? That was the animating question that propelled these great rabbis. And the oral Torah explodes onto the scene, really, in a formalized way after the temple's destroyed. The oral Torah is the answer to the question. How do we do it? How do we perpetuate a close connection, an intimate connection between us and God at night, when it's dark, when we no longer have the light of the temple? The answer is with Torah, and specifically the oral Torah that we carry within us. What's the end game? The end game is when we once again have the light again. When you say Shema in the morning and there's light everywhere, there's light permeating the whole world, that's an indication of what it looks like 
once things have been restored and we once things have been restored and we could declare our allegiance to God when there's light everywhere. There's light permeating the entire world. That is a description of redemption. And the story of Passover and the story of the Haggadah is telling the transformation from saying the Shema at night to saying the Shema in the morning. The story of Passover and specifically the Haggadah version of it, where we talk about the transformation of the Jewish people, we go from nighttime, throughout the whole nighttime, until we arrive at the end game, at the conclusion, at the redemption, where we can finally recite the Shema in the morning. Like we said, the Egyptian exodus is the model of what redemption looks like. It was the first redemption, and all future redemptions follow that pattern. And when we read the version of this story in Scripture, it's a sad and depressing one, because it's all about the pummeling of Pharaoh. And that is very germane to us, because that could happen to us. In fact, we made the argument, a controversial argument, that it already did happen to us under certain circumstances. But Talmud says to us clearly, Messiah could come in one of two ways. Do you want the Pharaoh version or do you want the Jewish people's version? And it's very important for us to remember what happened to Pharaoh because that is relevant to us because redemptions can follow that version as well. And maybe they already have to a certain extent. Pesach is a time to think positively. It's a time to think about how via telling over the story of the Passover redemption and the Passover exodus, via what we do this night, we could go through the entire night, i.e. the entire exile, and be redeemed in a much more positive light. So, of course, when we read the Haggadah, we must remember what happened to our antecedents. Our great-grandparents experienced tremendous suffering and were redeemed in miraculous fashion. And that is something that should be very inspiring for us. It should evoke prayer and song and delight and overwhelming gratitude. This is, after all, the founding of our nation. But we also must take this story and understand that this could be us as well. And yes, there's a version of the Exodus story that's a little bit more painful and it, it consists of plagues. That's what happened to Pharaoh. And that too is relevant to us because that could be our destiny. But in Pesach, when we read the Haggadah, we're thinking about a very different dramatic version of it. And we see this model of the five rabbis and they start off by asking the question, how do we do this? How do we say Shema at night? And how do we transform the saying the Shema at night to the saying the Shema in the morning? Read what happened to the Jewish people. Read how they called out to God. Read how they committed themselves to God. Read how they remembered where they came from. How they remembered that they come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they experienced redemption via 10 miracles. We must know that we too can have that version of our history and our destiny. And we too can experience the coming of the son of David in a generation that's entirely righteous. I thank you all for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I hope everyone has an amazing Passover. Chag kasher v'samech, a kosher and a happy Passover.